find the book of Psalms and take a left a couple books. If you, if you hit Ezra, you went a little bit too far. Uh, one of my favorite books in the Bible, Nehemiah. We've been, I've been preaching from this book uh, for some time now, for, for several weeks. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly the timeline, how many thousands of years ago that the book of Nehemiah was written. And someone might ask, you know, what does that have to do with us? What does that have to do with us where we are today? Well, I think it has an awful lot to do with us because Nehemiah was commissioned to go and to do a real work for God. Uh, The the condition of the nation Israel, it was broken down. It, It was neglected. They had turned away from God and mixed the worship of God with idols. And because of that... They, they brought judgment upon themselves. And the Scriptures tell us that God chastens, He disciplines those that He loves. And, you know, when Israel was walking with God and they're in fellowship with God, no enemy could stand before them. They could beat anybody. They could beat armies of hundreds of thousands without ever picking up a sword or drawing an arrow because it was the Lord fighting for them. But other times when they rebelled against God, they neglected His Word, they stopped keeping the Sabbath and obeying the Word of God, and people's hearts were turned away from the Lord, then even little, the tiniest of armies would defeat the people of God because God was no longer in their midst. And Israel had been carried away into captivity. Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer to a heathen king, and he tasted the wine and maybe the food before it got to the plate of the king. And one day he asked somebody, how were things going back in Jerusalem and the report that came to him was things are not good things are not well the people are in shame and reproach the gates are burned out the wall is broken down and the gates are burned with fire and Nehemiah you know what happened to him his heart was smitten he began to weep he began to sob he began to cry out the Bible says to the God of heaven he began to fast and mourn and he put himself at the front of the line. I want to say to you this morning, guys, that if we're going to see revival in our town, then we've got to put ourselves in the front of the line and let God deal with our own heart. Let repentance come to the church. It's so easy to get lulled into religion and play games and you might compare yourself to other people and say, well, I don't do the things that they do, so I must be all right. Compare yourself to Jesus. Compare yourself to the Word of God. Let God's Word be like a sharp sword to get into your heart and let God deal with your heart and... Then like Nehemiah, we can put ourselves at the front of the line. God, we've sinned against You. We've turned our back against You. I haven't kept Your Word. I hadn't walked with You like I should have. Grant me repentance. Let me turn. And in doing that, we'll have the ability to influence God. To move people into the presence of God. And for people to see, this is not a show of religion. This is the reality of laying hold of God. And so Nehemiah was given permission to go back and to begin rebuilding the city. He found people that were of like mind, like faith. Nehemiah, we're tired of seeing broke things broken down. I believe that's the unity in this church. Man, I'm tired of seeing people go to hell. I'm tired of playing church. I'm tired of going and just going through the motions and playing games. That, that's why uh, we said, you know, we fight so hard for freedom. It's... I believe, you know, we could go home right now and say we've already been touched by the Lord. Why? Because we fought to get into these altars and to pray and to believe God and to exhort one another. That's what it's all about. It's not about your favorite song or a nice sermon. It's about being with God and being vulnerable in His presence and speaking to Him and letting something come out of your heart so that you're being changed and the Holy Ghost is stoking the fire in your heart so that it don't go out. That it doesn't matter if you've been saved for two weeks or 25 years. That heart ought to burn for Jesus. And you grow in dependency for Him. And then as you go to look out on the world, you'll say, I want other people to know Jesus like I know Him. So Nehemiah finds people that are of like mind and like faith. And and what I love about it, they were unknown people. 
people that if it wasn't for God recording their names in the Scriptures, a lot of these names, I've tried to read them to you. I don't know how to say their name. I don't know how to pronounce that. But you know what? God knew their name. And here's the thing, Josh, they were created to do that work. Before God put them in their mother's womb, he had, you're going to build this part in the wall, Chuck. You're going to build this gate. You're going to do... And, and people locked arms and, and people built this section and another family built this section and each part of it was important. The wall, we've talked about that. What's a wall for? It's to keep things out. If there's ever a time that a wall is needed, it's right now in the 21st century. Because when Nehemiah got to the city of Jerusalem, here's what's going on. Anybody and everybody could come in. Thieves, robbers, good people, bad people, every kind of thing could come into that temple and there was no separation. Lindsay just read to the children Scriptures, every one of them deal with separation. Be careful who you and what you allow into your life because not everything is good for you. There needs to be a wall. Parents, there needs to be a wall in your house. There's things that we don't allow in here. Things I don't want my kids watching. I don't want them here. I don't want them listening to because those little ears are tender and they matter to God. And it doesn't matter if you're 85 years old. There needs to be a wall in your life that I recognize what's of God and what's of the world. And I'm not going to allow anything and everything to come and to influence my life. Somebody say amen. Let me know you're alive this morning. So that's the purpose of the wall. Listen, the gates represent ministry. Jesus said to His disciples, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. If you bind it on earth, it will be bound in heaven. If you loose it on earth, it will be loosed in heaven. Real ministry, I'll tell you what it does. It looses the power of God. It gives God an opportunity to move. Even It doesn't matter if it's on your job. Bunch of nasty mouthed people. You know what? You need to open up a gate. Speak the name of Jesus. Talk about God. Tell somebody what God has done for your life, you're giving God an opportunity to work. They may laugh in your face, but I can assure you, God's going to deal with that heart. God's going to deal with them when they're alone, driving home, they're laying in the bed at night. God's going to do something because you opened up a gate. You gave God an opportunity to move. Prayer, worship, uh, preaching the Word, that's all a ministry that, that opens a gate that gives God an opportunity to move. This, this, this morning... I want to talk to you about the next gate, and we've already talked about several, and uh, I'm not going to go through the review of all that for the sake of time, but I will remind you, I put all the messages that I preach on YouTube, you can just go look up my name, and I encourage you to jump in and and go along with us and study uh, the gates and the meanings of the gates that Nehemiah had restored. But this is Nehemiah chapter 3. And we'll read verse 13 and 14. It says, The valley gate repaired Hanun and the inhabitants of Zenoa. They built it, they set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And a thousand cubits unto the wall to the dung gate. But the dung gate repaired Malchiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of the part of Beth Hakurim. He built it and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. I want to preach this message this morning entitled Rebuilding the Dung Gate. Rebuilding the Dung Gate. Will you pray with me and pray for me as we get into the Word of God. Father, we thank You for Your Word and the privilege and the opportunity to hold it, to read it, to study it, to preach it, to expound upon it. Father, I pray today for Your anointing upon the reading, the preaching, the hearing of the Word of God. Lord, give us spiritual eyes that can see, Lord, how this message pertains to us right here as part of the 21st century church of Jesus Christ. Lord, give us spiritual ears that can hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches because we know we have, you have much to say to us in this hour. Father, I pray that you would give us a heart that's been prepared and cultivated by the Spirit of God to hear your Word. God, let it fall on good ground today. Let it bear fruit Father, we thank You for what You're going to do today. And we ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. 
and amen. I want to preach to you this morning rebuilding the dung gate. The dung gate is perhaps the most unattractive, but one of the most important gates that was in all of the wall that Nehemiah re- rebuilt. It was at this gate, the dung gate, that all of the sewage and the garbage left the city and it went to the valley of Hinnom or the valley of Gehenna and it was burned there. So this gate was built so that loads of trash, smelly, gross, disgusting things could go out of this gate. Just imagine if there's no dung gate, imagine the condition of the city of Jerusalem. Where's the garbage? It's on the ground. It's in the road. It's in the house. It's everywhere you step. All of this, it's littered all around all around town. You think, you know, here in America, we've got good uh, sanit- sanit- whatever, sanitized. I don't know. We're, we're, we're sanitized. So, you know, you, you don't see a lot of things like that. But I know going to places like Nepal and places that I've been where there's open sewage, uh, sewers on the side of the road and you know it's real beautiful on the mountaintops and in the little little communities there on the mountains but if you go through a town you literally have to hold your nose to be able to ride through there and not get sick at your stomach because there's no sanitation there in that city so this is the purpose of the dung gate all of the sewage all of the garbage all the rubbish, all the waste of the city of Jerusalem, it's all going out the dung gate. It's a gross and a disgusting place, but it's one of the most important gates in all of the city because if those things aren't moved out, if they're allowed to remain and pile up, it's going to produce sickness and disease and contamination all in that city. Let me tell you what the dung gate has to do with your Christian life. Christianity Christianity is not just about the things that you gain or the things that you get or the things that you accomplish. Much of Christianity is about the things that you get rid of, the things that God pulls out of your heart, the things that you put off, the things that you lay aside, the things that you allow God to crucify in your life because if those things remain in you, they will kill you if you allow them to remain. You can't hold on to it everything that comes. Something's got to go out the dung gate. That's why the dung gate needs to be restored. It needs to put back, be put back in the church. It needs to be put back in each individual life. It's important that it, that it remains. Uh, one emphasis, if, if you want to jot this down, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, just thinking of holding on to things that you need to get rid of. God told the first king of Israel, King Saul, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, I want you to go and kill the Amalekites. The Amalekites were the ones when Israel was very weak and and tired coming out of Egypt. They weren't warriors. They weren't soldiers. They didn't have any weapons yet. And while they were weak and weary, the Amalekites crept up behind them and declared war on them. You might remember the story. Moses went to the hill and sat on a rock and Aaron and Hur held his hands up while Joshua defeated Amalek down in the valley. And God says, you're going to have war with Amalek from generation to generation. It's a picture of the flesh. It's a picture of the type of me and you that just don't want to do what God says. We're hard-headed. We're stubborn. You give us half a chance. We don't go the right way. We go the wrong way. Well, God says, to Saul. I want you to go get rid of them. He gives him about 250,000 soldiers to go, put them to death, get rid of it. I'm I'm tired of dealing with it. It's not going to be a pretty picture, but here's the deal, Richard. If you don't kill the Amalekites, the Amalekites are going to kill you. God had equipped Saul with all these soldiers to go and get the job done. It's not like just one man go over there and do it all. You've got everything you need. You know what it's a picture of? Jesus has already given us the victory. The ability to walk with God. The ability where sin don't have dominion over you. You get to walk in victory over sin. We're set up for victory. Well, let me tell you what Saul does. He goes over there. He fights a little bit. But you know what he does? He just picks out what's really bad. What's really disgusting. 
what's no good and what anybody would go, oh, I don't want that. And he puts all that to death, but everything he thought, I've got a use for that. Oh, that'll be good for me. Oh, that'll be nice. He saves all the good things and the nice things. He even saved the king of the Amalekites and didn't put him to death. And he came back and said, hey, God, we did everything that you told us to do. I did your job. And you know what? Saul lost the kingdom that day. That's when God said to him, rebellion is witchcraft. Stubbornness is iniquity, and obedience is better than sacrifice. God says, you didn't do what I wanted you to do. You kept the good. You got rid of the bad. When God says it's all bad, and this is the importance. When God puts His finger on something in your life and says, I want it gone, it can't stay. Well, you make excuses for it. You say, well, it's okay, it's all right, it's not really that bad, or other people do it. Let me tell you, what you allow to remain in your life will ultimately take your life. At the end of 1 Samuel, Saul is surrounded by Philistines. They're doing battle. He, his sons get killed, and Saul falls on his own Sword. He's laying on the ground suffering and dying. And a man walks up. And Saul says to this man, he's laying there suffering and dying. And Saul says, who are you? You know what the stranger said to him? I'm an Amalekite. I'm an Amalekite. And that Amalekite stood on top of Saul, the king of Israel, and took his life there that day. Listen to me. That's why there needs to be in your life a dumb gate, a place where the garbage, a place where the waste. Goes. There's beautiful gates. The first gate we talked about, the sheep gate, was a picture of Jesus, a place where the lambs went in to be slaughtered for the sins of the people. There was the fish gate that represented evangelism and going out and winning souls. There was the old gate where the Word of God is being brought back into a modern society. There was the valley gate where we walk through trials and now we're broken. We've been humble. We know now that we need God, but after you go through that trial, how many of you ever, have ever been through a valley and you learn things about yourself that you didn't know were there? And you're like, God, I don't want it anymore. I'm sorry for the failure and the sin and the stubbornness of that's going on in my life. Guess where? The next place it needs to go, it needs to go to the dung gate. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Things in your life that need to go. And one of those things is in your thought life. There's not a one of you here today that you couldn't tell me that at times you're not bombarded with thoughts that you know are ungodly, unrighteous. They didn't come from God. They came from hell. Let me tell you what. You can't help so much what enters into your mind but you can help what you entertain in your mind. You know, the Bible says people want to blame God when they're tempted, but James wrote, every man is tempted when he's lured away by his own lust. Lust gives way to temptation. Temptation gives gives way to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, produces what? Death. It produces death. Listen to this. I heard a story one time of a soldier that had went into the enemy's camp and he radioed back to his troops, hey, I've taken the prisoner. Well, the troops send word back to him, well, bring, this, bring the prisoner with you. Come back to camp. Well, the man radioed back and said, he won't come with me. My prisoner won't come back with me back to camp. Well, they radio back and say, well, just leave the prisoner and you come. The man radios back and says, he won't let me leave. Now who's the prisoner? Right? So many people think, so many men think, well, this is a little deal. I've got, I've got control of it. It's not controlling me. I'm not hurting anybody when I do this. Nobody else sees me do it. I can tell you what, guys. Sin will slowly but surely, it'll paralyze you. It'll dampen what God's done in your heart. It'll drive out the spiritual life that God is trying to produce in you. Listen to this scripture. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. 
For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. The imagination, it, it, it speaks about your thought life, reasoning and, and logic and, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And listen to this and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Here's the deal. Either you take your thoughts captive or they will captivate you. Thoughts come into your mind. I can tell you what, probably 90% of them, you know where they need to go? Out that dung gate. Into the garbage with you. Because if I dwell on that, it's going to lead me away. I can tell you what, this is an, a day and an age when you have to guard your mind and you have to guard your heart because that enemy is there to allure you away. And it, it may be just a little simple thought and then you're dwelling on it. Think, yeah, I might could do that and nobody would know. Or I might could get away with that and nobody would ever see it. And before you know it, that thing is dragging you further and further away. Now it's not so bad bad anymore. Now you're thinking of all the, all the reasons why you should be able to do whatever it is you think about doing. And that thing has captivated you and it's doing it. It'll produce sin and sin will ultimately produce death. Listen to this. It's the will of God that the Holy Spirit governs your mind. That's who is to be guarding your mind. The Holy Ghost of God. God will even, He'll get to the point. You know, Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount and there were a lot of men that could lift their hand and say, I've never committed adultery. I've never actually cheated on my wife and stepped out of marriage. But Jesus went a step further than that and said, if you've ever looked at a woman with lust in your heart, you know what you are? You're an adulterer. You see, that's what the Holy Spirit of God will do. He'll take it further than what you did with your body or with your hands. He'll even go into what's going on in your mind, what's at whatever's going on in your heart, because God wills that the Holy Spirit governs your mind and He governs your thought. God says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2 that He'll renew your mind. He'll make it brand new. He'll make it fresh and pure and clean. And He will wash your mind with His words and he'll change your thinking, your logic, your imagination from a lost sinful man into the mind of a man that's born again, filled with the Spirit of God and on his way to heaven. This is a broad range of things because think of this, ever how old you were when you were saved, it was that long that your mind and your heart and your imagination was shaped by the world. Some people got a mind. It's full of pornography. It's full of lust. Every woman you look at, you, you're, that's what you're thinking about. Every time you're alone, that's what you're thinking about. Your mind is consumed with lust and with sin. Other people are consumed with jealousy and evil thoughts. They can't be happy about that other people are doing good. They, they can't be a part of a group or of a team because their thoughts are full of maliciousness. You know, all of these things, the world brings that in there. Maybe people have been rejected and abandoned. My wife was telling me about a young lady really acting out at the jail in the midst of ministry there yesterday. And I said, the bottom line, that girl's been hurt some where somebody damaged her, somebody walked out on her, and she's mad at God. She's blaming God for what's going on in their life. That world will do that. Other people have a victim mentality and they blame other people for the problems that are going on. It's always somebody else's fault. That came with man in the fall. Adam says she gave it to me. She blames the snake. Adam blames the woman. Ultimately, we blame God for the things that go on in our life. Other people have no value, no worth, no self-esteem. They're just no good. They look at themselves like that. I'm, I, I'm no good. I'll, I'll never be anything. They, they look at themselves that way. You know what God says? This is what I want you to do. Take every one of those thoughts captive. Don't let them captivate you. You know what? You don't have to think like that. That's right. You don't have to have a mind full of lust. You don't have to have a mind full of bitterness. Or you don't have to have a mind that, 
blames other people or accuses other people. Bring it captive to the obedience of Christ. You know what the Bible says? That Jesus, this is His obedience. He became obedient unto death. Even the death on the cross. You know what? The cross says, I don't have to think that way. The cross says, I've been given a new mind. Even the mind of Christ. Jesus will teach you how to think about other people in a proper way. Jesus will treat you how to value people. Look, Jesus will treat you how to properly value yourself when you realize what He's done for you on the cross and the value that God has put upon your life. So these thoughts, a lot of them, y'all, they need to go out the dumb game. You may have, how many of you talk to yourself and argue with yourself sometimes? I do. The worst trouble I have is that sucker I looked at in the mirror this morning when I got up. He trips me more than anybody does. Sometimes I talk to him, do it. We're not going to act that way. We're not going to think that way. That's not who you are anymore. You've been born again, washed in the blood. That old man is crucified. And you are a brand new creation in Christ. You know what I'm doing? I'm preaching to myself the gospel and the word of God. And in the midst of it, God is renew, renewing my mind to think the way that God has ordained for you and I to think. Listen to this. Holding on to things that need to go will kill you. Even your body. God designed your body. It's going to consume food, Right? And then immediately when that food is consumed, your body begins to break it down. It takes what it needs to grow and to be strong and to give you energy, but the rest of it, it's on its way out. It, it, it may be a little bit crude language, but you can understand what I'm telling you. That steak that you ate last night was very good, but this morning, it's toxic. It's on its way out. It, it's on its way to get... And your body is equipped to handle that, to get rid of the toxic, to, toxic things that come into your body. That's the purpose, y'all, of the dung gate. Things that you don't need in your life. Things that will damage you and kill you and destroy the spiritual life that God produces in you. Some people hold on to grudges. Some people can't get over what somebody did to them 20 years ago, 5 years ago, 5 days ago. And you know what it does? You get bitter at that person. Well, I can tell you that person may be moving on with their life. They ain't even thinking about you. But if you let it, it will put you in prison. Some people have been in prison for five years because one of their friends walked out on them. Somebody been in prison for 25 years because a spouse left them or, or cheated on them or this didn't happen. Somebody died that you love and what you allow it to do is to produce bitterness in your heart against God and drive you away from what God wants you to be. I can tell you that's why there needs to be a dumb gate. Let the hurt go. Let the pain. Let the grudge go. Get rid of it because I know this, what they did to you is not greater than what God has done for you when He gave you His Son. Let it drive you to God or let it push you towards Him. Listen, if you're going to walk with Jesus, you're going to see people walk out on you. That's part of the dumb gate. When people come that didn't need to be there, Nehemiah was of this mindset. He didn't go to anybody and everybody and say, do you want to help me build this wall? He found people that were of one mind, one accord, because ain't everybody good. You remember those people? Sanballat, Tobiah, they come. They criticize Nehemiah. They said, what you build, it's going to be torn down. This is a joke. Then they come back later and said, we want to join up with you. We want to be a part of it. Your God's our God. Nehemiah just wrote him a letter and sent it to it and said, I'm doing a work for God. I don't have time to get down and talk to you. You've got no part or lot in what we're doing right here for God. That's the dung gate. The reality of it is some people are holding on to people that need to go. They need to be removed from out of your life. That's not unloving. That's loving God. Because if somebody is trying to move you away from what God has for your life, they're not your friend. They are your enemy. And the best thing that you can do is just let them go because where they desire to take you is not a good place. And it doesn't mean that I'm better than you. It doesn't mean that I don't love you. It means like Nehemiah said, I'm doing a great work for God and I don't have time 
for the foolishness of this life. I work to take care of my family. I pray and study to leave this church. I'm going to be here. I promise this church, if I can get out of bed and walk, I will be here on Sunday. A lot of sacrifice, a lot of sweat and tears have gone into this. And a lot of people have come and gone. But no matter who comes and goes, it needs to be the determination of your heart. I'm going on with Jesus. I'm doing the work of God. God will send the people to the Lord's end to be a part of this work for God. I, I remember I was about 18 years old and my best friend at the time, he wasn't good for my life. He never held a gun to my head. He was just, I, 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 was, I was bad. We get drunk about every day together. And I remember one time we were out at his daddy's house. His daddy was a World War II veteran. It reminded me a lot of my own granddaddy. He didn't, he didn't paint in gray. Everything was black and white when he spoke. He didn't have to be a rocket science, scientist to understand what he said. But he looked at me one day and said, Son, if you keep following him, he's talking about his own son, right in front of his son. You keep following him. You're going to look up one day and you're going to be going one direction and everything you love is going to be going the other. Amen. I didn't know what to say, but I knew exactly what he was talking about. And it's true. I wouldn't swap places with that man today for a million dollars. And there came a time in my life where I had to make a choice. Where are you going to go? Who are you going to be around? You know the people that I want to be around? People that love Jesus. Amen. People that encourage me in the Lord. People that will at least have a heart that's sensitive to the Lord and know that they need God. And God will see to it that your life is surrounded by it. That's what church is meant to be. And I both know everybody that goes to church is not going to heaven. Their heart is not right for God. You need to have the awareness of that. Some people, you know, Jesus said there's tares in the wheat. There's goats in with the sheep. There, there's all of that that's going on. It goes on in every church. It does. And some people, some people just need a little time. We're not all on the same plane this morning. We're not all on the same level of our faith. Some people need time to grow. And you need patience in dealing with them people. Thank God He didn't get rid of you when you messed up. Thank God that so much of His dealing with you is behind a closed door, not out in the light for everybody to see it. So you need to be patient with people. Don't gossip about them. Go encourage them. Love them. Text them. Take them out to lunch. Share something with them. Do something in the name of Jesus to help them. Other people, they ain't never going to get it. Because the big eye is in the way. And they're going to keep blaming other people. And they'll just be here for a few weeks. They're looking to see what they can get rather than who they can get in Jesus. And you just have to know that. But this is what I love about Jesus. He invited everybody. Amen. This church invites everybody. Amen. I'll fight to keep it that way. This will never be a three-piece suit and tie club. You know, it's so good to have the mayor with us here this morning. Amen. Appreciate you coming, brother. But I can tell you what God has put in my heart, man. I'm looking for broken people. Amen. I'm looking for people from the other side. I'm looking for people that have been walking. And I know now, Richard, something I didn't know when I started. It's hard to reach them. Sometimes they, they've got a lot of trust issues. They've been hurt. They've been betrayed. They don't know what real love is. Sometimes you'll have to chase them and chase them and chase them. I love Jesus. He left 99 to go get one. And He will continue on to do that. But listen to this. Jesus never begged anybody to follow Him. That rich young ruler comes. What have I got to do to go to heaven? I imagine he's real slick, Chuck. Hey, what up, Jesus? What I gotta do to go to heaven? Sell everything you've got, give it to the poor, get in line and follow me. Amen. He never told anybody else that. Why did he tell him that? Because if I make it easy for you, son, your riches, your fame, your ego, it's always gonna get in the way. So this is your choice. You know what that boy did? He went out the dumb gate. He went sorrowful. He never followed Jesus. John chapter 6, Jesus is preaching. Everybody likes to come and eat the fish and the loaves that He makes. Everybody liked the miracles that He did. But here's the deal, He said. A few days from now, I'm going to the cross. And I'm going to bleed and I'm going to die. And unless
unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, that, that means that they believe in what he did for them on the cross and accept that sacrifice, you've got no life in you. You know what they started doing? One looked at the other and said, I don't know about all that. I, don't, I ain't really into all that. Oh, me either. And they all began to murmur. And you know what they did? The Bible says a great multitude of disciples turned and walked with him no more. You know what Jesus didn't do? Oh, I'm sorry I said that. Did that offend you? Please come back. We'll, we'll come up with another way. We'll come up with a, a way that you like because I just want you to be happy and I want you to feel good. He never did that. Amen. You know what he did? He turned and looked at the other 12 who were for real and said, what about you guys? Are you going to go away too? He gave them the same opportunity. I'm not going to beg you to stay here. And if you stay here, you're going to have to know the demands that are going to be laid upon your life. It's not going to be easy. There'll be a valley gate, a bunch of them, where you're broken, you're humble, you're made nothing so that God can be made. There'll be a dumb gate when things that really matter to you in your life, Jesus will strip them away from you and it'll cut you into a thousand pieces and you'll come to the same place he came to in that garden of Gethsemane. He says, nevertheless, I don't like it, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Those disciples said, we don't have anywhere else to go. You've got the words of eternal life. So this is it. That's the dumb gate. Some people are going to go out of it. And it'll hurt for some people to leave. But I can tell you, God's making room in your life for you to grow, for you to draw near unto Him and to get rid of hindrances and things in your life that do not need to be there. Listen to this. Fourth point that I have. This is about the Valley of Hinnom or the, the Valley of Gehenna. All right, listen to this. As you would go south along the wall, I need to have a picture of it. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll have one next week. You go south along the wall that Nehemiah's building. You go south, you hit the valley gate. And I just believe that's right because it's a place of humility. It's a place of going down and being broken. And then at the furthermost tip is the dumb gate. And outside the gate, there's a huge valley called the valley. In Hebrew, the word is Hinnom and the Greek, the word is the, the word is Gehenna. Listen to this. In Second, Second Chronicles chapter, I think it's 34, Israel has a king named Manasseh. Manasseh became king when he was 12 years old. Manasseh was a very wicked king. He didn't do what was right with God. He didn't walk with God. He, he took things not just bad, but next level bad. And in the valley of Hinnom, he set up idols. One of the idols that he set up was to the god Molech. Molech was this image that they set up that a fire burned in his chest. They would build a huge fire in his chest. And he had two arms that stretched out like this. And they would literally bring their children and their infants and put them in the arms of Molech. And their children would be burned to death as an offering to the god Molech. In this valley, they also practiced witchcraft. They worshipped all this stuff in the Bible. You can read it. King Molech. Manasseh also put his own sons through the fire of through the fire of Molech caused Israel to sin grievously turned away from God imagine if the king's doing it how many people are involved in that what kind of demon spirits have got to be involved for you to throw your baby in a fire that's the darkness and listen to this this isn't some heathen from the other side of the world these are the people that are supposed to know the one true living God but oh when things get dark y'all God's got a plan there's a boy born two generations later, the grandson of Manasseh is a young man named Josiah. Let me tell you what Josiah is. He's a reformer. He's a revivalist. 
He's a real man of God. He became king at eight years old and he walked with God. And as soon as he got big enough, he tore down his granddaddy's idols. He cut down the groves. He took the god Molech and he ground that image to powder. He put out the witches. He put out the wizards. He put out everything of black magic, every bit of witchcraft. He drove it out. And you know what he began to do? He began to fix the temple of God. It's been run down. It's been neglected. Hey guys, let's get a crew. Let's fix it up. Let's let's put the doors on it. Let's put some paint on the walls. We're going to get back in that thing and we're going to start worshiping God. Guess what they found while they're cleaning up the temple? They found the Bible. After all these years, isn't that incredible? You got the Word of God, but you lost it. Where is it? It's in the house of God. You know what they started doing? They started reading the Bible. They started seeing what God was like. That king, even though he was eight years old, he started saying things like, I never knew that about God. We've been doing it wrong. Let's repent. Let's get it right. Let's start talking to God. And God started moving in Jerusalem. But let me tell you what. uh, Let me tell you what Josiah did. He turned the valley of Hinnom into a garbage dump. This place where they did all that bad stuff and burnt their babies and all the darkness was taking place. You know what it became? A garbage dump. You take the trash out the dung gate. You go to the deep valley of of Hinnom. You dump it off the ledge in, down in, in the bottom part. There's a fire burning. You can see the smoke. You can smell the ashes. It never goes out. If you've got garbage, it gets loaded up. It goes out the dung gate with all the waste, all the nastiness, all the sewage. And it's burnt in the valley of Hinnom. The Hebrew, Hebrew word Hinnom is, is translated the Greek word Gehenna. In Gehenna, it's the same place where the filth and the garbage and the sewage and the dead animals, they're all burned in the valley of Gehenna. Listen to this. Jesus preached that Gehenna was a picture of eternal hell fire. This word Gehenna is used 12 times in the New Testament. Jesus preached about it 11 times. Going to be people going to stand before God on judgment day. Jesus said, I'm going to say to you, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. They're brought out to a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's Gehenna. That's the valley where the trash is going to. Jesus said in John 10, 28, He said, don't fear them that can kill your body, but fear the one that can cast both your body and soul in hell. That place, hell, is the place called Gehenna. I'm telling you today that hell will be the final garbage dump where God gets rid of everything that would not submit to His Word and to His way. It's going to be a literal place, a lake of fire, a place of of sulfur and brimstone, a place where the fire never ever dies out. It it burns for an eternity. That's what the dung gate, that's what this valley truly represents. Listen to this. I'm landing this plane tonight, today. But I want you to know, it's a real place. A place where things are going to be burned. And sadly, y'all, a place where people are going to be burned for an eternity. That's why it's important let there be that dung gate functioning in your life. You know what? That's a ministry. You know what it is? It's a ministry of repentance. Turning away from it. Letting go of it. That's why Jesus said literally, even if your right eye offends you. You know what? That Bible says the eye is the lamp of the body. The things that you look at, the things you pay attention to, the things that come into, through your eye, into your mind, into your heart, you know what it does? It'll corrupt your soul. You know what he says? Pluck it out and get rid of it. If your right hand offends you, cut it off, cast it away, because it's better to go to heaven crippled than to go to Gehenna, this valley where it's burning day and night, to go there whole. Listen to this. All the churches in Revelation, when Jesus wrote to them, He said, you need to restore the dung gate. There's one church, He says, I like the things you do. The church at Ephesus. But you've left your first love 
You know what? You've allowed things to come into your... You know, sometimes things that are harmless and innocent. I've gotten obsessed with bass fishing before. Nothing wrong with going bass fishing. Somebody say amen. 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 But if that's all you think about and it consumes your heart, you know what? It needs to go. You can get consumed with sports. You can get consumed with your job. A lot of us, I just, my hat is off to those that are, that work a full time job and they're dedicated to the ministry. You know what they're doing? They're coming to church with dirty clothes. They're showing up at the jail at, at night after they, they've been up. When they got up, it was dark. And it'll be dark when they get home there that night. I, I commend that. I, you know what that is? That's balance. That means you're, you're, you're at work. You've got a job. But that job don't have you. It can be a good time to draw near to the Lord. But if you let it bring you to your, separate you from your first love, that means Jesus is the utmost pro- That means I may be on the road at four o'clock in the morning, and by the grace of God, I plan to be. But I plan for Jesus to be the Lord of my life at four o'clock in the morning. With my family, God bless the family, God ordained the family. But you know what? Jesus should be at the center of every relationship. All of these things, don't let it separate you from your first love. Listen to this. There was one church, the church I believe at Thyatira, they've got Jezebel in the church. You know what she is? She's a spirit. He says that he, that spirit, she entices my servants to commit fornication and eat things that have been sacrificed to idols. You know what it represents? A spirit. That intoxicates people and seduces people to sin against the Lord. You know where Jezebel needs to go? Out the dung gate. That's what happened to her in the Word of God. She was thrown off the ledge of a building and the dogs ate that woman and all they could find was her head and her skull. Not talking about treating people bad. I'm talking about people, things, spirits that come to move you away from God. You need to hit the door because this place is going to be ordained for the real worship of God. This other church, the church at Laodicea, we've got everything we need. I don't know who he's talking to, but he ain't talking to me. I'm good, I'm good. You know what happened? They thought they had everything they needed, but they were missing the most important thing about a church. Jesus is on the outside trying to get in. I remember when we started this church, a man called me. Here in town, and asked, "Well, do you have this? Do you have that?" And every, you know, he asked me ten questions. I answered, "No, we don't have that. No, we don't have that." And I said, "Here's what we do have: we have the Word of God, and we believe we're in the will of God." And I just know, guys, if you have those two things, you can do without a lot of things. It ain't about the the building that you got. We didn't have one then. It ain't about the worship team that you have. We didn't have one then. It's about Jesus. And He says, I'll build my church. I will. People will try to tear it apart. The devil will try to tear it apart. Nevertheless, Jesus said, I will build my church. He's going to do it. Let it be His church. Let Him have the utmost priority. I believe if we really let Him be that, y'all, we'd never get out of here. And nobody would go to sleep. It would be an explosion with every heart on fire with Jesus Christ. I'd never get the microphone because it would be filled with testimonies of what God has done in our lives throughout that week. Do you want that? Two of you do. Well, you two that want it, let some things go out the dung gate so that it will happen in your heart and in your life. Lastly, turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. I want to read to you what this gate really looks like in the life of a man of God. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 4. Paul says, Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks he has whereof he might trust in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised the eighth day. I'm of the stock of Israel. Of the tribe of Benjamin, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews, and touching the law, I'm a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, I persecuted the church. 
concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I'm blameless. But listen to this, verse 7. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ." And be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is by the faith of Christ, the righteousness of God which is by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings and being made conformable unto His death. You read the Apostle Paul's resume. It was one that it would have made any religious man Jealous. I want to be like that. A real Pharisee. A real righteous man according to the flesh. But there came a day in his life when he saw Jesus. And it put all those things to shame. I've been to the height of religion. I'm the Pharisee. I'm the man that everybody looks at and says, wow, look at that man of God. But one day he saw Jesus and he said, you know what? I count everything that was great in my life as dung. It's rubbish. It's garbage so that I can win Christ. You know what he realized? I can't have both. Everything that I thought was gain to me, I just count it as a loss. And you know, it may be a one-time thing, but I really think it's over the course of a lifetime. Jesus, you can have this. Jesus, you can have that. You know, instead of just dropping by this gate and letting the garbage go through, I believe he just dumped his whole life out at the dung gate and said, God, you can have it all. Give me a new one. I just, everything that I thought, everything I labored for, Jesus, I'm giving it to you so that you can give me a brand new one, so that I can have Christ. The man Malchiah who built the dung gate in Nehemiah 3, you know what his name means? My king is the Lord, or the Lord is my king. You know, that's who's going to go to that gate. Jesus said in John 6, 46, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things that I say? It costs nothing to call Him Lord, but it'll cost everything for Him to be the Lord of your life. I want to ask you today, I'm very aware that all of us have some things need to go by this gate that we preached about this morning. Because you know what it is? It's garbage. It's garbage. It may be things, you know, things you look at on your phone that take your time or they bend your mind. You know, this day, everybody's tick and Snapchatting, every kind of thing, you know. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not harping on that. But I am telling you, you need to guard your mind. You need to guard your heart. For the righteousness of God to reign inside of you. Things and thoughts that you've entertained. You know, maybe this message is just right on time for you. You're thinking of something. You know it's not right. You know what you need to do? You need to take it captive today to the obedience of Christ. Jesus, I thank You that You give me victory over my mind. I do know there are people, they can't even sit in church without their mind wandering somewhere. But it doesn't need to wander. You know what? That's not the will of God for you. God wants to make you like a sponge where your your heart can observe His Word. David said, my soul is like a deer panting for for the streams of water. That's how my soul longs for God. I'm thirsty for God. And when I'm there with Him, I'm able to receive from Him. Listen to this Scripture. Proverbs 28, 13. It says, He that covers his sin shall not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes his sin shall find mercy. If you try to cover it up, guys, you're not going to get far. Last thing I want to do is rail at people. Things I can't see. But I know there's things that God sees. And I can tell you what, that's the reason this this gate was built. You know, when we read about the other gates, there were sometimes a lot of people that come to build the sheep gate and the next gate. But it only gave one name, Brother Robert, at the Durham Gate. I think it's twofold reason. How many people probably want to be a part of that gate? It's a sneaky job. 
thought that that'll dirty jobs, you know. Not everybody's going to want to do that. Not everybody's going to want to get real with God and let their heart be open before Him. And places that I've said, no, God, that's off limits. I'm keeping that or it really ain't bad. Now I'm dropping it all. Jesus, take it from me. Because I want you more than I want anything. And another reason, last, that He sent one man is because it's an individual affair. That's right. You're responsible for it in your life. You know what's there that doesn't need to be there? You know what's hindering you? A lot of times it's one thing. Why does this keep coming about? It needs to go out that day. It needs to go out that day. Some of you may have people in your life. You need to let them go. That's not unloving. That's not unkind. It's just this. You can't hold on to everybody. You can't. Because they'll drag you away. I want to ask you to stand this morning. And as Kyle comes to play, I want to, guys, open up this altar. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to rebuild this game in this church. God says it's broken down and it needs to be restored. Folks, you know, just like I know, I, I'm, I put myself in the front of the line and there. Got some things off and let it go into that fire and burn because I'm not going to that fire and burn. I want to go to heaven. I want to go to Jesus. You know what I want? I want clean hands and a pure heart. That's the heart of the Spirit of God. What needs to go out? What needs to go out with the rubbish and the trash and the sewage? It's something in your mind that's haunting you. I tell you what, Jesus wants to go.
I'm following Jesus. Oh, a time in my past, I was the darkness. The Bible says it. I was the darkness. But now I'm light in the Lord. Oh, Jesus, help our lights to shine. God, you're driving out darkness so the light can shine. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the restoration of this dumb game. Oh, God, it may sound gross. But we thank you for the importance of it, God, that it can be rebuilt in the church. God, I pray for the church of America as a whole, holding on to things that don't need to be there. God, we just release it to you in Jesus' name. Let this church be what you want it to be. Let it have a healthy dumb king. People are always coming in, God. The people are always welcome.